Hi, I'm Frank Giorgini, and this is an Udu drum. Today we're going to show you the step-by-step -step method of creating a drum like this. It's the all-clay ceramic Udu drum, traditional of Nigeria, or West Africa. Uh, I specifically learned from Abbas Huan of Zaria, Nigeria, at Haystacks Mountain School of Arts and Crafts in Deer Isle, Maine, in 1974. And over the years, I've oh, developed and refined the technique until we have what we call the modern Udu drum. What makes the drum different than other drums is it has no skin. Technically, it's a, called an idiophone. It works by a vibrating column of air. A traditional drum with a skin on it would be a membranophone, but without the skin, I have no attack on the skin. I'm just vibrating that column of air, much like a, a log drum that, you know, um, they would hollow out a log and just beat it with a stick. Okay, today we're going to show you the traditional coil method. I'm going to form the bottom of this pot. It'll set the size of the drum, and then I'm going to coil my way up to the top and show you each step of the way. Okay, let me remove this for a second. Okay, this is how we start with this uh, fired ceramic form. It's what we call bisque. It's the first firing. Um, in Africa, they would start a traditional pot over a, uh, an old pot. Say you had a cooking pot and it had a chipped lip. You could take that pot, turn it upside down so you had this smooth surface, and then build another pot on top of it. Sort of gives birth to another pot. Uh, I make udu drums, so I have different sizes of these bisque uh, shapes, these forms, and that sets the size of each one of my drums. I make four different sizes in the set of what I call the professional models, coil-built, handmade drums. Okay, the first step is to take some moist clay. Now this is a specific formula of clay, uh, much like the recipe in cooking, there's a certain combinations of ingredients in here that I've developed over the years. So although I'm going to show you details of every step of making the drum, you don't get my special formula or the temperature. Okay, I'm forming a, a round patty of clay. And the rounder you get it, the easier it'll make the next stage. Okay, that's, you know, that's quite round. Now I'm going to sprinkle what we call grog. It's actually clay that it's been uh, fired already and hardened and then pulverized. This will just help to keep it from sticking to the surface of the form. Okay. Put this right on the top. If you've seen the, the slideshow of Abbas Huan making a drum from Haystacks in 1974, you'll see that he worked right on the ground, bent over, and circling the form at each step of the way. But that's back-breaking work, and putting it on a nice turntable like this, a sturdy turntable, it doesn't wobble. Center your form, and then let it spin around. Okay, next we take a flat rock, and I'm going to pound this down, compressing the clay and stretching it over the form. Now, you don't want to hit it like this because you're just stretching it out. I want to compress it. 
So each time I'm going tangent to the center of the, uh, the form. And you can see how it's starting to walk down the side of the form. Now this is an ancient and traditional way of making pottery in most every early culture. And it works specifically well when you're making the drums because you're compressing the clay. Much like um, when someone's making cymbals, you pound the metal and it gives it a certain tone. Uh, with the clay, you're compressing it and making it stronger. The clay particles are very minute, tiniest particles uh, of material. They're the end result of the geological weathering of, of rock. So it gets worn down over millions of years until the particles are just so small they don't wear down any smaller. And that's basically what clay is. But they're still flat little disks. So when they're all random, stuck together, as they would be in this clay, they're all like this. But as you pound, they come and they interlock, you know, sort of like this. And that's what makes the drum much stronger than if you uh, did it in some other method, like throwing on the wheel. You can make an udu drum throwing on the wheel, nothing wrong with that, but you're actually stretching the clay out. So it doesn't quite have the same sound. Now, the only trick to doing this is that you don't want it to get too thin, and you want it to be of uniform thickness all the way around. So it just takes a little patience and time. Okay, I have a little specialized tool that I made which has two pins on the end of it and that way it's sort of a gauge for the thickness for me. I find it very useful. So I can see this is a little thick there. The little holes won't make any difference. Uh, I'll keep pounding and paddling and burnishing. In the end, those holes will cover up and it won't make uh, any difference, no problem. Okay, you have to keep controlling the drum as you go around. It tends to want to spread apart. And you can keep trimming as you go along too. If you let it come down too far, which is often the case when, you be, when you're beginning, the weight of the clay can tear tear the form. So you can see it's I'm relatively uniform as I go around, but it's thicker than I want it. So I started with quite a heavy rock to move the clay. Now I'll use a little bit smaller rock, a little lighter, but always with a flat surface. This is actually the bottom of the drum. It sets the size of the specific drum, and then we will eventually flip it over and coil up from that point. I'll check the thickness again. Okay, I'm quite uniform. Now I'll switch to a wooden paddle. You can see I've carved and sanded in a slight concave surface. You start off with the heavier rock because that moves the clay. The weight of the rock compresses and pushes it down. 
The paddle doesn't move the clay as much, it just sort of smooths off the surface. I'm already starting to put the rhythm into the drum. I can see the bottom edge of the coil so I can better judge how thick it is when I get down like this. Okay, I'll trim it again. If I brace my arm on the edge of the table and hold my hand relatively steady and turn this around, I should get quite an even cut there. Okay, again, you can see it's pretty uniform, and that's what I'm looking for. And I think I'll just make it just a little thinner. As you're doing this, you'll find that once the paddle starts to get a little damp, it'll start to stick to the surface of the clay. So then you want to move to a, another paddle. Okay, I'll trim it again because each time I paddle, it's the areas that were a little thicker will travel down a little bit further than the other side and have to just even it off each time. Okay. All right, it's relatively smooth, but we're going to smooth it even further by uh, going with a wet rock over the surface. Abbas used a wet rock, taking again a flat rock like this, and we'll wet the surface too, so it slides. And then wet the rock and go over the surface like this. And then the other side. And then I go perpendicular to the direction I was going back and forth. One of my tools that I use now, I like better than the rock, just it's a piece of uh, very hard wood that um, I've put a slight concave surface in, and that really is just a little bit of a refinement. It really slides over the surface easier than the rock. I'm giving it a quarter turn so that now 180, back and forth like that. Okay, that's pretty smooth. And now I'll just take the edge of the sponge and dry off some of the surface water. Okay, that's the first step. Now that, like I said, is gonna be the bottom of the drum. It's too soft and wet to take off right now, you can see. I would deform it trying to get it off. But all, all week long, I've been uh, making udu drums at the different stages so that we can go from one to the other. This is the second in the four drum series that I make. So when that gets a little drier, I will remove it from the mold and place it in a little cradle like this. 
You can see here I have this little form that sits in here, piece of foam to cushion it so I don't make a dent in the bottom. I put a, a plastic bag around it so that as I work, I can keep covering it up. When I'm usually working on drums like this, I may start four at a time. And each day I only go up one coil. Actually, the first day I usually only put the bottom. I cover it up for night. The next day I put a coil on, on all four, which may take me uh, three to four hours doing that, just to go up one coil, uh, about an hour per drum, because I'm very precise on how I do it. Okay, keep your clay covered up. Okay, now, before I can add a coil to this, I have to score it and moisten it. And uh, you can use just this pin is all you really need, but I like this little tool I made that's actually the end of a cocktail fork that I put in an exacto knife handle. It like doubles my efficiency. Okay, scoring is very important. When I do workshops in the school, it's always the hardest thing to get people to score. They just want to go, you know, like this. And it's just not enough. You want it to really grab when you're going to mush the two pieces of clay together. Get that straight. And I usually go this way, again, sort of perpendicular, so I got it going both directions. And on the inside, same thing. Okay, and then usually I finish off on the top with this thin exacto knife blade. This way when I dribble the water on the top, it's going to go into these thinner, deeper cuts and make this top edge the uh, softest and sort of mushiest first. Um, I want to use a minimal amount of water because if you start dribbling the water on it runs down the sides and softens the whole form which then makes it very difficult it gets floppy and you can lose the whole thing so when I add the water I'm basically gonna just to try and make the water stay up here in the scored area and that's why this deep scoring also helps Okay. Now, I'm doing everything traditional with small innovations that I've made. I've kept what I think are the most important aspects of making the drum, uh, compressing the clay by pounding with the rock. You'll see when I paddle and everything, but there's certain innovations that I think are very helpful. Uh, like instead of rolling out a big coil of clay, which is certainly a way to do it. I have an extruder, a machine that you put a lump of clay in and you push down a lever and you get a very uniform coil of clay. And it makes it much easier to keep control because this uh, coil is gonna be, you know, the same diameter as it goes around. So I use that. Uh, let me just moisten this first. We'll show you that. And then I'll squeeze out a 
extruded coil. So watch when I add the water here. I'm trying to keep it from going down there too much. If a little bit flows down, flows down, it's not a problem at all, but you don't want it to reach the bottom and uh, then make a puddle in the plastic. And then as your clay sits there, it just gets soft and mushy on the bottom and you'll run into a problem. Okay, I'm going around and And be a little freer going on the inside because you can always dry off the inside easier. Okay. This is a rubber rib. I'm picking up the water and uh, smoothing the inside at the same time. Okay. Now I'm going to extrude out a coil long enough that I think it's going to reach all the way around. Okay. Okay, you can see what a beautiful coil this machine squeezes out. It's just like a Play-Doh machine. You put the clay in and pull down a plunger and it comes through a little sort of die and makes a beautiful uniform coil. So same thing whenever you're attaching one piece of clay to another, you have to score it and wet it and mush it together so that it really melds together and becomes like one. And what I'm showing you here doesn't have to be limited to making a drum. It's basic coil-built uh, pottery, hand-built pottery. You can make sculpture with it. You can make pots with it, anything. But if you do it this way, you'll have a very strong vessel. Okay, I then go, usually I go around it again after it's set for a minute or so with, again, this single point now. And score it some more. Same thing on the inside. My left hand, I'm just moving my thumb and slowly spinning the turntable. Okay. Now I'm ready to lay this on here. Looks short, but actually it's longer than it needs to be because as I squeeze it on there, it's going to start walking. Okay, now you can see what I'm doing here. I'm trying to align the scored part with the part below it. Yeah, this is usually the hardest coil to put on for the, uh, this first one because it's the widest part of the drum. From here on, it's going to get taper in, so it's kind of nice. You get the hardest one done first, and every coil after it is smaller and somewhat easier. You can see already that uh, the two coils are touching. Okay. Now, get yourself in a good position because this is real important when you're working. There's a tendency as I squeeze this, you can see 
it was traveling this way. If I just squeeze it now, it's going to tend to go out because I have extra clay up here. And when I squeeze, it's got to go someplace. It's going to go up and out. So if you work uh, at this point, work across from you, you can see the way my hands are like this, just because the way they're attached to, uh, <laughs> to my body. So the whole thing is control. It's very easy to lose control, but you can see as I'm squeezing it now, it's coming in this way, and that's what I want it to do. If I just go ahead and squeeze regular, it's gonna go up and tend to go out. It's hard to bring it back in again. So because they were scored really well on both the coil and the top lip of, lip of the uh, the pot here, the clay is really becoming one. And I've had a few drums break over the years because somebody dropped them on a cement floor or something, but I've never had one crack along the seam. So that's just sort of a testimony that this method, if you take your time and really make sure it's mushed together and score properly, you won't have a problem. If you don't, if it's too dry and not scored enough, it'll just come apart at the seams. Again, you have to just keep control of it all the time. This is a sort of labor-intensive process, coiling. But you sort of have complete control over it. Some of the drum shapes I've made have been non-traditional and become very sculptural. And, but I'm using the same method. You know, between my fingers, I can feel where it's thick and where it's thin and adjust accordingly. And again, I'm always trying to control it, pushing it in because it wants to always spread out. Okay, now I'm going to take this uh, rubber rib. Uh, these black ones are usually a little stiffer than the, uh, the blue ones. Uh, so each has a specific use. This... I'll push the clay down. And also, you'll notice whenever I use the rib and scrape like this, I'm always going downward whenever I can. And that's, again, to drive the clay into the clay surface below it. You don't want to scrape this way because you're stretching it apart and it's uh, only going to weaken it. Okay. Now, on the outside, I'm going to paddle this down. This is probably uh, one of the most important differences between just traditional coil building and, uh, oh, the, I guess the Nigerian technique or West Africa and probably other cultures too, but using this paddle to always um, shape and pound the clay in. I take a wet paddle now and now I'm striking down. I'm smoothing it off and really driving the clay into there. As soon as it starts to stick, you have to wipe it off and re-wet it. can take this, smooth it, and I'm pulling some of the water off of it.
Okay, you can see it's starting to come along, but I want to keep pulling it in. So once again, I go around and squeeze and form it in. It's easy to uh, stretch it out a little later if I have too much of an angle going in, but it's very hard to bring it back in, especially after it starts to stiffen up. You'll get an idea in real time <laughs> how time consuming this process is. Okay, I think I've gone all the way around. Again, I'll take the rib and smooth the inside. Take this other rib and do the outside. Again, trying to keep it going inward all the time. It's quite moist now, so it's floppy. Um, as it starts to stiffen, I come back to it and uh, keep control of the shape, either with the rib or paddling it. Okay, now this is as far as I would go. It's as far as I can go at this point because it's so moist. So, I take the plastic bag and I bring it to that level, put the clothespin on it. And now I'll just sort of let the, um, the top coil dry I don't want the bottom to keep drying out every time. So this will sort of control the drying better. Okay, um, and I just have to wait. But fortunately, this now has a coil on it. And I would go around. This has been trimmed somewhat already, but it's, I keep going over it again. With this metal rib now, I can, if there's any bumps on the inside, these will shave them off. and then I'll smooth the inside. It's important to have the inside as smooth as possible too. Uh, there's another method of making uh, the pots or the drums where you use two halves and put them together, but you always have a seam on the inside. Uh, this is much better for getting uh, the truest sound out of it because you're uh, You're depending on the fact of the, uh, the sound sort of bouncing off the surface on the inside, and if it's all full of bumps and stuff, it's uh, gonna break up the sound waves a little bit. So 
amazing how round and smooth you can get things uh, <laughs> with just paddles and rocks. Now, it's not necessary to make your udu drum uh, perfectly smooth. Um, I was trained in industrial design, so it's hard for me not to. Uh, and I think it does definitely make the best sound. You know, if you, it doesn't have to be round, but if it grows like a gourd would grow with no uh, corners or acute angles, you'll get the best sound. But certainly, you know, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the nice thing about the Udu drum, especially as a, a workshop uh, vehicle for kids, is it doesn't have to be perfect. And you could see in the final process we use of burning it with uh, the smoke and the fire, the clunkier they are, sort of the better they look because they look like some sort of ancient artifact that's been dug up. But as I say, this is the sort of my professional series and uh, I'm trying to squeeze the most sound out of this instrument that I can. And I believe that by making it smooth and of uniform thickness, as thin as I can get it, yet for it to maintain its strength because uh, you are banging on it. So if you get it too thin, it will crack. I think I'm, uh, it's about a little more than a quarter of an inch thick. I think I measured they were pretty consistent, 0.8 centimeter thickness. So I'm, the same thing I'm doing here is scratching back and forth. Like I said, the nice thing is that this coil that I'm going to put on is a little sl smaller than the last coil, so <laughs> it's encouraging rather than discouraging. Okay, the clay is uh, at a good stiffness. It's not too hard that, uh, um, you know, that it's going to be a problem of the very soft coil going on clay that's too dry, but it's, it's stiff enough to hold its form. Okay, again, we add the water. And I'll get a coil. Actually, like my old rip sponge better. I try to do the scratching a different direction on each side. Like if my last scratching went this way, I want to scratch this way, just so I don't have it going this way and then this way again and maybe, uh, you know, cut right through the clay. Okay, I can see I have a little puddle of water in the bottom. Just dry it up. Smooth it out.
Okay, ready for the next coil. I support the drum with my one hand here while I'm pinching it down with the other. Again, working so that my hand is contouring the same way I want the clay to move. Then with my thumb, I'm going to push down like this and sort of smooth and mush the coil into the clay below it. Okay, again, trying to bring it in. When you work with clay, it's, uh, oh, you really, get to appreciate the difference uh, when your clay is just right, you know, if it's, if it's the right consistency. If it's too stiff, it's hard to squeeze and it, it tends to go out much more. This is just about perfect right now because I can still bend it in and if it's too far out, I can sort of compress it and it wrinkles a little, but still it's soft enough that I can squeeze it into shape. And that's the reason I sort of do one coil a day on several drums and then wrap them up and let it stay overnight because the coil that you're putting on is usually uh, wetter than the, uh, the clay that's below it because you've done it already, the clay, you've formed it, and it's dried out some. So when you cover it all up with plastic and let it sit overnight, the wetter part dries some and the drier part wettens up some and they get harmonious. Okay, now with the I think this is real important to drive the clay into that what's below it. I'm using the rounded side of all these ribs, not the sharp edge. It uh, flows over the surface much easier.
I read someplace that George Washington could crack a walnut between his thumb and his forefinger, but I don't believe it. He was just a little guy, and I can't do it. <laughs> I've been squeezing this clay for 30 years now. <laughs> All I do is get cramps in my finger. Okay, you can see it's starting to take form. Okay, well that would be just fine for this stage. Again, I wrap it up and put a clothespin on it. Usually I'd be, I'd do this in the morning more or less, put several hours in and work on four drums and then leave them open during the uh, day. I'm working on something else in the studio here. And, but keep checking them in case they are deformed anyway. I can, as they get stiffer, I can keep the shape. And then at night, I often uh, do some uh, trimming and scraping and get them into the shape I want and then sort of put them bed to, at night and cover them all up and start again the next morning. Okay, again now this is, this is the, the next stage here. I forget what coil we're on, but we're making our way up. Again, I feel the inside. Uh, I trimmed this up some yesterday, but I can feel it's, could use a little more on the inside. You can see now we're started to uh, change the direction of our contour here. Before we were going, kept going in uh, at a pretty severe angle, and now we're going to start going up for the neck. Now there's a definite relationship between the volume of the body of the drum and the length of the neck and the diameter of the neck and the size of the hole and everything else. Uh, I mean, anything you make basically, you'll make a sound, but uh, if you want to refine the sound, you have to work out the proportions where you can squeeze the most sound out of this instrument that isn't really that loud, unless you amplify it. But it is quite magical, a deep haunting, sort of heartbeat sound.
Okay, I can see this is gonna be much quicker, smaller coil. Still working across from me, trying to control the direction of this coil as it, it stretches and moves up. Going down like this with my thumb on the inside, pushing the clay into that below it and stretching uh, and smoothing it off. I can pinch it in every now and then. Once you get up towards the top and you can't fit your hand in there too much with the rib to smooth it off, I just use a different kind of tool. And I just reach in here and smooth the inside. Also, still going downwards whenever I can to make sure I'm pushing the clay above into that that's below it. I really can't get the paddle in here anymore. So I just use the rib, support it on the inside. Okay, I think we're gonna move along real fast to the next stage, the next coil. Okay, we've been dried up and smoothed out a little bit and ready for yet another coil. Okay, well remember our first form over here, uh, if you leave it too long, the clay shrinks as it dries and the form underneath it isn't gonna give any, so that clay is gonna split, so as soon as it's stiff enough and you can handle it, take it off and I usually just put it like that. I'll let it dry out some more, but then I will cover it up with a plastic uh, before I put it to bed for the night. Okay. Again, once you start coming up, you can't get in there anymore. You have to have another kind of tool. This is what I use to scrape on the inside now. This is, uh, I think, a spatula of some kind. OK, 
kitchen tools tend to double as clay tools. Getting near the top, this is actually the last coil we're put on, I think, before it's ready for the lip. Getting so nice and tiny. This is the second in size of the, the set of four drums that I make. And the finished size be about 14 inches tall from the inside of the drum uh, to the lip. And this would be two size, three. Oh, it's about 16 and maybe I think it's 13 something. No, that would be wrong. <laughs> That'd be smaller, that's a small one. They go up about an inch and a quarter each size. I think the biggest one's about 16 inches tall. But I don't really go by measurement. I go by sound, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Okay. Again, I try to make it look like it's, you've picked it off a vine, like it's a, um, a gourd that grew on a vine. So I try to have nice, smooth form and contours, and I think that makes the best sound besides it. Looks the most natural and can't beat nature. Here's my favorite part. This is how we tune it. It's gonna start talking now. Okay, we have an udu, it's alive.
Okay. Okay, that's a good sound. Uh, the, the length of the neck is, is quite crucial. This is just about in the right place. Uh, if it's too short, uh, it's, there's what they call a, a shorter sustain. means right now it's going boom, and it, you, there's a sustain. It lasts a long time. A short neck or just goes boop, boop, boop. And the longer the neck, the more sustain, except you get to a point where it sort of chokes itself out and then uh, you cut it down a little bit. That's a good sustain. It's about a count of two or three. Okay. So, again, it's ready for the, the lip here. Again, we've prepared this already. This and I'll go to the next one. Okay. Different drum, but just about the same spot. Almost exactly the same. Okay, that's good. All right, I'm going to have like seven size number two drums by the end of the, <laughs> the session here. Okay, I'm going to trim this off. I use the X-Acto blade for that. Okay. Now, Abbas gave this to me back in, uh, I guess in 89, maybe, 85. Anyway, every one of my handmade drums, I used this roulette to put a design just under where the lip is going. So this is the time I would do that. So I just hold it against there, support it in the center, you know, inside, and just sort of do it this way so maybe we can see it on the camera. Okay, so that's just something I do on every one of my drums, and this is uh, just something I've been using the same little plastic shape <laughs> for 30 years, uh, but that's the size that I like to keep the neck. So I keep the neck consistent, the side hole consistent. Um, even on a bigger drum, the top of the neck, I keep this size and the side hole this size. And of course, uh, it's sort of, it's good for my hand. I don't have really big hands. If you have big hands and you were making a drum for yourself, you could make a bigger hole. But uh, I think this seems to work well for any of the sizes I'm making and it fits almost everybody's hand. Okay, now we're going to put the lip on there. I'll show you how I make a lip there's many different ways to do it, but I'll show you the way I do it. But first I'll score this again and get it ready.
Okay, I'm not going to put any water on it yet because I'm going to form the lip, and if I put the water on right now, it might uh, get too, too mushy. Okay, let me just put this over here. Okay, start off with a ball of clay. This is my little lip making turntable here. Now first I'll start there. Okay. And this is the shape I use to Keep a uniform size on the lip I'm going to have on the top. And again, it's compression. I think the pounding of the clay makes it stronger. And you know, when I was pounding to make the form in the beginning and even now. And it has an effect also on the temperature that you can fire at. If you pound the clay like that and compress it, compress those platelets together, you can fire at a lower temperature, yet have a, a stronger clay. The lower temperature is good because it gives you that very deep haunting sound that's typical of an udu. Uh, I see a lot of people making udus that stoneware fire them, which is a high fire technique. And uh, they look nice, but when you hit them, it doesn't have that nice deep earthy tone. It's more brittle sounding. So this method of actually doing all this work of pounding the clay, always compressing and pounding, enables you to keep a lower temperature, uh, which gives you that nice haunting sound, yet the strength that you're gonna need because you're gonna be beating this thing with your hand. Okay. I have the same size lip on all the drums. Now I'm going to score this. I would probably let it set up a little while before I put it on, but uh, actually I have one that's set up already. I planned ahead. Okay, so this is how I would make this, and it's a little soft to put on, so let me get that one that I prepared already. All right, so you can see this is easy, a little easier to work with. I can run my finger across here and smooth it out. Okay, and I'll score this.
my water on here. Drum back to center stage here. You want to make sure that this is uh, stiff enough that when I tap this down and push it down to get the two pieces together that I don't uh, squish the neck any. Okay, try and center it as best you can. Okay. Now, we're pretty close. Okay, this I would cover up and let sit for a while and then I have the last stage of the drum ready to go here okay it's been a busy week but I did this one yesterday I started I think last Saturday making these things so that's on there pretty good now but uh, you can see I have to trim it to open the hole up so that uh, the same diameter as the inside of the neck. So I'll just work my way in on that. When you're making this lip too, you want to be very careful and make sure that you don't have any little uh, burrs on it or rough edges because this is the area the palm of your hand is going to be bouncing on. And uh, if you don't, you know, make an effort to smooth it off, it's going to be very annoying. Uh, some little burr that keeps jabbing you in the palm of your hand. You know, I like to have a flat surface so that you can control the sound. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Now, here's a tricky part. Now you have to make sure that your drum is stiff enough to do this in the neck, which I think it is. I'm gonna roll out this little coil of clay. Make a drum like this. And place it like that. <laughs> to have confidence. Okay. So I'm going to put a little coil of clay right around in this corner, which will reinforce it, and uh, I can smooth off this rough area where I joined them together. Just put a little water on there. 
Again, you can't do this too soon or else <laughs> when it's happened, they tip right over. Okay. I will follow my advice and score this a little. Okay. Now, we have to put the hole in yet to make it an actual Udu drum. Okay, but before I do that now, I'm going to uh, just make sure that shape is the way I want it. Again, the object isn't that it has to be perfectly round. And if you're just making drums, and especially if you've got students making drums, you know, smooth is not necessarily the, the goal, just to make the drum. Now, I look over the contour like this, and I can feel it too. There's little bumps there, so... I'm, I'm looking at the silhouette of the drum, and as I turn it, you can hear it to start speak to, speaking too. I like to not be able to see the seam if I can <laughs> help it. <laughs> Usually I'm pretty good at that. Okay, got pretty good shape here. Okay, now comes the time for the placement of the hole. It did compress just a little bit, so I'll just smooth it off a little. Okay, you want your hole right around there. You don't want it so close up on the neck that it interferes with your hand trying to, um, you know, move. It's sort of here. You don't want it down below the, the halfway line because you're, you're depending on hitting that hole, making the vibration of the air columns go in and bounce off the other side. So if you're here, the air just goes right out the other side and it's not that sound efficient. So 
Just look at your drum, decide where you think it might be, and uh, make believe you're playing it. So that seems about right. I'll just put my little form here. Trace it, make sure it's gonna be good. Okay, now I'll use a sharp little X-Acto knife blade And here's my drum hole. I saved these and put a, like a serial number on the inside of the neck here. And I also write the same one on the, the hole. And then I string them like beads and I have my inventory. <laughs> okay. Same thing with this side hole. You want to make sure there's no rough spots on it. Don't forget to smooth off the inside because everybody likes to stick their finger in and <laughs> see what's in there. And you can also, it's a good idea to just take your paddle and make sure that's flat and smooth, because that is the part you're gonna be banging with your palm. So, you can't hit it too hard now because it's still rather soft, but you can hear it's got that wet, wet whopping sound because the clay is still moist, but Basically, you have the Udu drum formed. Now, what I'll do also, it's still a little moist, but I will, what they call, burnish it. So I'll let it sit out for a little while until it gets a little drier, and then I will take a spoon and go over the whole surface on the outside and that sort of closes the pores of the clay and gives it a nice sheen, especially when you do the, the smoke firing that you're gonna let the fire and the flame uh, put a design on there for you. You can see this, it gets a little sheen to it. And if it was drier, it would get even shinier. But I would do the whole drum with that and then I sign the inside of it and put a serial number on the inside. And then we have a completed Udu drum. Right here, I'll bring back that one I started with, although, let's see. Yeah, this is a is actually a number three size, so you could see the difference. This will shrink down a little bit, about 10%. Um, so this is a two, this is a three, and there's one bigger and one smaller. But, and the nice thing, here's the biggest difference, well, after this gets fired, I think, than anybody else's drum, and what makes it is that pounding, is this sound. See, that's that nice counterpoint. Now that ringing sound, this is very low fired, lower than you would think, and yet it has that ringing sound, but it's not brittle. 
It's got like a bell sound, you know? And that's what's sort of unique about my drums. And, it, and the sustain. Okay, we're gonna have uh, some performance by some real percussionists uh, that are gonna blow you away with the sounds that they can pull out of these Udu drums. Okay, thank you for watching. Here are the drums that resulted from the uh, drum making session that I did. Uh, I ended up with seven big drums and one of the smaller drums and uh, now they've been bisque fired in an electric kiln. The sound that they have now will not change in the next firing. We're going to do a barrel firing to put uh, smoky color on them, but it's at a lower temperature than uh, this bisking. And I, I do fire to a specific temperature with my clay body, but um, a standard bisque temperature, uh, cone 06, uh, is fine with most clays. So you get that nice ring, and it's got the nice sound. Okay, we're going to take these now and take them outside and uh, do the barrel firing. This one has a... Uh, terracigillata slip on it. It's a very fine clay slip and I started doing a little decoration on here but these are just been burnished that we showed you smoothing with the stone and um, it sort of seals the surface and uh, when the smoke goes on it it'll, it'll really make the nice patterns of flame and smoke uh, stand out because it is burnished smooth. Okay so we're going to head out with some of these drums. Okay, now we're going to uh, smoke fire these drums. Uh, in this barrel here, there's several different ways you can do this. Um, this is a 55 gallon drum cut in half, just like you'd make a barbecue. And uh, I find it, it's easier access. You can do it vertically and you can even buy uh, like a galvanized garbage can and uh, either punch holes in it yourself or they make them with holes in it specifically for this kind of uh, firing. So I've, I've set the uh, drum on the ground. There's actually a piece of uh, stone underneath it. Uh, I've put a cinder block on either side so it doesn't roll, makes it secure. And there's a hole at either end on the bottom and there happens to be some holes in the side, just it's worn through. But you do want air to flow through and you want to be able to control it a little bit. This is to get it started on the bottom. And then I'll put this grate under here. That's so some air can flow through. And then I'll start laying down a bed of straw. This is very dry hay from my neighbor's barn. The horse would choke if he tried to eat this but it burns very nicely. And you can use uh, other materials in here, dry leaves and uh, a mix of paper, um, sawdust, all kinds of things. I choose things that burn fairly fast because I've tried to develop this so I can do it in uh, a classroom period. And then I lay the drums in. I usually put the bigger volume of the drum towards the inside just I think it's a little safer that way if, uh, if you're doing it in the classroom you know for a class usually the drums are smaller and you can get 
like a dozen drums in sometime. Most of the time, uh, if you're doing that uh, other method, they're about this size. But this should work out just fine. Put some straw in between them because where it's pressed together, that's going to leave an uh, interesting mark. You want to be in an open area. I've set up a hose, you know, just in case you gotta douse some flames. Wear old clothes because they're gonna smell. So you can pretty much cover your drums. You can uh, place like objects against it. I've used like cut out shapes of tin foil uh, and then just like wired them on there or to keep them there. And that will uh, be like a resist from the smoke. And that looks pretty good. Okay, now I'm going to put the lid on. This is the other half of the barrel. And we set it on there. And this has some holes along the top here. And you can control it by moving it back and forth a little amount of air. And on the bottom, there's a hole at either end that the air is gonna blow through. Now we're gonna move away and clear off the area of anything that's combustible. Have a pair of uh, gloves ready. Piece of cardboard. All right, just gonna clear any of the combustible material away here. Okay, I do have a hose in the background if we run into any kind of flaming trouble. And I'm just gonna start this. There we go. Now good idea to put on some thermal gloves. All right, we want like a, a steady uh, smoke like this. We have a nice little breeze going here, so it's doing a fine job. If, uh, if it's not uh, breezy, might have to come over and fan it. And this would be a nice level of smoke. You don't want too much flame all at once because it heats it up too fast and you want some nice dark smoke over a period of time. This is gonna take about, only about 15 or 20 minutes. That's why I like it to do in a, a school situation because we can load it up, fire it, smoke it, the kids are outdoors. I usually do it in the springtime so we can be outside and the leaves aren't dried out. And then we could empty it all in a 45 minute period. All right, it's really only about 20 minutes later and uh, you can see the smoke has pretty much stopped and uh, got my gloves on, we're gonna take the lid off. 
and we're okay. We got some nice, uh, nice markings on it. Basically, where the um, smoke hits and it gets reduced, it's dark. Where air goes, you get a lighter part, and it oxidizes, and you get a lighter color. So they're still pretty hot. If you have gloves, I could grab them now, or in Africa, they would use a stick like this and pick them out just like this. Now this method is gonna give you this smoky look here, different shades of colors from uh, blacks to browns to grays to, you know, light colors. Uh, and if you have put a design on your drum, you would, you know, see this design. You try and arrange it after a while. You could maybe figure out that uh, where you want the airflow to go. So if you have a, a color design, if the air is hitting that part, you'll be able to see the design more. Here's this one here. Oh, this has some very nice straw markings here. This is always exciting when you get this kind of thing happen. And when we wax that, that's going to really come out bright. You can see where the where there was some air here, it's light, and you get the green. Remember, these were both green. Where it was dark, where the got reduced, you don't see much green at all. The soot will come off when we wash it and wax it, but it'll still be basically dark. Oh, that's got some nice shades on it there. The other method to make them completely black is to do them raku style, where I take, I heat the drum up in a in a kiln, a raku kiln, take it out when it's hot and put it into a barrel, a, a metal barrel with sawdust or something in it and that will burst into flames and smoke and then put a tight lid on it and let that smolder until it goes out and then you get that total black uh, surface and if you've burnished it it's really beautiful. But it involves a whole nother firing, the fuel involved in another firing, and a whole nother day. So, uh, this is much quicker and it does give a very nice result. So we're ready to um, rinse these off and then wax them up. I have another drum here from actually from another firing. It's a little smaller size, but it has just been rinsed off like I will do to these and uh, let it dry up some. If you leave it in the sun and it gets a little warmer, the wax goes on nice and easy. But all you're gonna do is take uh, basically any, any paste wax and just rub it into the surface. You can see right away it gives it sort of a wet look. And you'll need at least two coats. So you put it over the whole drum and take a clean rag when it dries a little bit. It's like car wax where uh, it gets a little hazy once it's done. And buff it up. You can see it's getting a little bit shinier. The first coat sort of seals it and then do it once more and you should have a good shine to it. And again, if you've done a good job of burnishing, you'll get a nice, uh, nice sheen to it. You can also use a uh, soft brush to uh, clean them up and get that uh, sort of hazy wax part off, especially if there's a little irregularities in the surface. This will get in there and put the shine on it. Then finish up with a cloth. Okay, you can see it's starting to come up now. I have another drum here. Again, another size. It has been burnished already. So you can see what a nice, uh, warm, interesting finish this uh, gives the drum and it's especially nice um, if 
you're doing these projects with the kids, they don't, I, my drums are very smooth. I'm, you know, catering to a specific market uh, of professional musicians mostly. But uh, when the kids make these nice, clunky, lumpy drums and uh, you do this technique, it always looks great because it's like, uh, like you dug them up out of a cave. They're like archeological uh, specimens. So it uh, really makes for a handsome product. And, They'll love them. Well, my full name is um, Abbas Magaji Ahuan. Uh, I would say my professional title is a ceramist. I'm a ceramist by training, and that's what I do, and that's what I teach. I was born in a village called Sakuak in Kachel local government. Uh, of Kaduna State. I learned pottery through my art teacher, I would say. His name is Michael O'Brien, to begin with, when I was in high school, junior high school. Uh, I went to Abuja, which is presently the capital territory of Nigeria, the capital state of Nigeria, and uh, right opposite the high school where I attended, uh, is the Pottery Center, which was set up by Michael Cardew. Now, our art teacher, Michael O'Brien, used to encourage us to go across and see how people make parts. Now, it was my first experience to see people uh, throwing on the wheel. Uh, it was at that moment that I took a lot of interest in pottery. And since then, I have been pursuing it. I first met Frank Giorgini uh, in 1974, summer 1974. Well, we, when we met, it was at um, uh, uh, Haystack Mountain School of Arts and Crafts in Maine, Derail. Um, it was basically for a summer course, which I was teaching. Uh, it was an African session, which was organized by the school. and. Uh, Frank, as my student at that time, uh, amazingly did not stick much into my mind. And uh, he was not one of these people who jump around or talk too much, but he's more of the contemplative type, you know, who thinks of why he's there, taking photographs, you know, busy socializing and uh, thinking. So you normally find that he doesn't, he's not a loud person. So I didn't, he, his memory did not stick too much into my mind until he wrote me let, later. Then, with a photograph, I remembered him. Um, yes, Frank came to Nigeria in order to pursue the drum form. Uh, and uh, looking at um, the trend that uh, his work has taken now, I, I would like to say this, that um, first, Frank is a sculptor by training. And he's using his knowledge uh, as a sculptor in order to um, to stretch his imagination and see how far he can take the drum part. Now, his coming to Nigeria gave him that impetus, that springboard, uh, uh, having experienced uh, firsthand uh, most of the, uh, the Nigerian arts and meeting the craftsmen, talking to them. I think there's no doubt that uh, this influences his work. And looking at his forms, looking at his decoration, his finish, one can almost confirm that he was influenced. I will consider my mission as a pottery teacher first as an educator. Uh, I feel that um, it is my own responsibility as a ceramic teacher to educate the Nigerians about the craft or the art of pottery. And also uh, the people I come in touch or in contact with in America uh, and other places I do go to, it is always my mission that I try to educate them about Nigerian pottery. That is number one.
Uh, this is this wonderful addition to our collection. This is really terrific. Okay, my contribution is actually the synthesis of meaning of different um, symbols brought together in this part, you know, to tell a story. To me, that is my, con uh, my contribution. I've been able to form a composition, you know, using different elements that will probably be on a part at a time, and I've brought them together. I think to me, that is a contribution, yeah. And I haven't seen it done anywhere else, yeah. What do you call these parts? We call these parts Kim Kim. Do they have other names? I presume they will have other names. I think these names are very much local and uh, related to language, you know, but we call them Kim Kim. Prior to the uh, coming of, the, of Western civilization to Nigeria, uh, that's pre-colonial period, uh, paths were very much used uh, for religious purposes. Uh, they were used by the pagan, uh, uh, I don't like the word pagan, by the traditional religions, that's what they are called. And uh, they were used uh, just as you use parts in a domestic setup. Uh, but there were some parts that really had more of a symbolic meaning, you know, standing for the reincarnated form of a god, you know, which was being worshipped, you know, by that particular society. So, parts were used on the religious aspect, yes. Well, music has always been a part of, uh, of ritual activities in the traditional uh, setups in Nigeria. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that the musical part was very much used, you know, for such purposes as well. Uh, it was used for purposes of incantation, you know, and also mesmerizing people that were possessed, you know, by the devil and things like that. So the musical part has always been there within the traditional uh, activities. The sort of stone that you are really interested in is, um, in the first consideration, yeah, is to make sure that you pick up a stone that will fit your hand comfortably. You need to work with a stone that is, not, uh, is just right for your hand. You can do a lot of designs. And this is a roulette. Abbas will cover some of this uh, as he's talking. And a roulette is just something you roll in the clay. It could be woven straw. And this is a traditional thing, to roll a roulette in the clay. Yeah. So you have your incising pattern, your burnishing, your roulette. All you have to do is to crisscross this, you know, and get a checkerboard. And that will mean the house or the family, the unity, and all that put together. Now, these are some of the symbols which I thought I would share with you this afternoon. We add it Precisely. as you are. That's it. Exactly. Right. Precisely. I found that I was spending too much time trying to do something that was not natural, so Precisely. it didn't come out it as powerful. It wouldn't come out. As, uh, even though it's controlled, it's just a direct approach. It just, just comes out comes as naturally to try and control it. Yes, absolutely. We have made a mistake. <laughs> I'll erase it. <laughs> His impact uh, on me was that of um, of joy. Uh, I felt extremely pleased with myself in the sense that, uh, at least, you know, uh, out of so many students that, that I taught, you know, one is really extremely serious, you know, and. Uh, I feel that he learned enough that he is interested to come back to the actual roots, you know, to my roots, to study, and also to give lectures uh, on what he had learned. So I felt that that was something uh, commendable. 